Okay. Om Ajnana Tamarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksura Militanina Tasma Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvise Shashunyavadi Pascha Deshatadine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Pai Evacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Nama Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadatha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I welcome everyone to our ongoing study, Bhakti Shastri, and we're studying Chapter 7 of the Bhagavad Gita. All right, I'll share this screen with you. Are you getting okay? You can see the screen? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, chapter 7, lesson 2. Objectives. <laughs> what Recording we, in progress. So, we want to identify today some uh, typical people who surrender and those who don't. That's first things we'll be looking at today, those people who are sur surrendered souls and those who are not. And then we will go on and we'll hear about uh, Lord Nityananda's mood, delivering the Naradamas, <laughs> Lord Nityananda's ocean of mercy. And then Lord, explain how Krishna is covered by internal potency with reference to Sanskrit in Bhagavad Gita 7.25. So we'll look at that. And then the importance of Punya Karma as a prerequisite for practice of Bhakti from 7.28. And an overview of Chapter 7, identifying significant sections and the links between them. So we have quite a few objectives here this morning. We hope we can accomplish all of these things in the space of the next two hours. So let's look what we covered so far. We began, the sep well first of all the connection from the sixth chapter is very clear I think. Remember at the end of chapter six, Lord Krishna described that the topmost yogi is the one who is always absorbed in thinking of him and engaging in his transcendental loving service. And then the seventh chapter begins with Lord Krishna talking about hearing. So hearing is the beginning of bhakti yoga. In order to practice bhakti yoga, it begins first of all by hearing about Krishna and hearing from Krishna and from Krishna's representatives. So this was the link from chapter 6 to chapter 7. And then the first three verses described about knowing about Krishna by hearing about him. The more we hear about Krishna, the more we will know about Krishna and we'll become convinced. We'll develop more faith. Then we went on to hear about Lord Krishna's energies. Remember, the, we showed the prakriti, there was the para-prakriti and the apara-prakriti, the superior and the inferior energies, and Lord Krishna's position in relation. That, that these, Lord Krishna is the energetic, he's the source of the energies. Everything comes from him. So the, the prakriti is Krishna's energies. They're not independent, they're controlled by Krishna. So that took us up to chapter 7. We heard about, first of all, the, the elements of the uh, 
material nature, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, ego. And then we heard above that there's a superior energy of mind, which are all living entities who are trying to exploit the resources of the material nature. And then we went on to hear about Krishna through his impersonal features. Does anyone remember any of the impersonal features of Krishna? Can someone tell me? Uh, Lord says, I am the, uh, the taste of the water. Yes, the taste of the water. Other uh, nine, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is mm. Found in ether and the uh, ability in man. Um, ability in man, yes. Light in the sun. Light in the sun. Heat, heat, heat in the fire. Yes. Om in the syllable, uh, Om in the Vedic Mantra. Oh, yes. All right. Good. Okay. So you've syllable got... Om in the Vedic Mantra. Uh -huh. And then we went on and we heard about the three modes, how the three modes of nature are controlled by Krishna. The three modes of material nature are controlling us, but Krishna is above them. Krishna is not controlled by the modes. Krishna is the controller of the modes. He's above the modes. And therefore, the conclusion was that we should surrender to Krishna. And if, if we take shelter of Lord Krishna, then we get relief from the three modes of nature. So, either we're controlled by Krishna or we're controlled by the three modes. Both ways we're controlled. We're not independent. People say, oh, I want to be free. I want to be free, do what I like. No, oh, no, they're controlled by the modes. The three modes are controlling them. But a devotee will surrender to Krishna and he's controlled by Krishna. So better to be controlled by Krishna than by the three modes. Okay, so this is, that's as far as we covered in the seventh chapter yesterday. We're going to go on. Oh, okay. Here's uh, an illustration from the Bhagavad Gita. Describing people who surrender and those who don't. You can see on the left, you have the pious people who have some sukriti and on the right you see the people who have no sukriti. Not, not anyway, no sukriti to bring them to Krishna consciousness. Hmm? So we're going to talk about these four different kinds of people. There are four kinds of people who surrender and four kinds of people who don't. So you can see on the the bottom left corner, you see someone's in, they've been injured or maybe they're having some economic problem and they're approaching the Lord. You can see that the man has got a child or a couple of children there holding his legs. So he's having some difficulties there and he's approaching the Supreme Lord for help. So. People come in that kind of situation, they're looking for some help, some benefit, and they come to Krishna. They're pious people. Without having Sukriti, they would not be able to come to Krishna. And then you have the uh, person in, so you have a person in distress, you have a person who is in search of wealth, you have the person who's curious, and then you have the person who is in search of knowledge. So four kinds of pious people who come to Krishna. And then on the right, we have the four kinds of people who are not pious, who, are not, who don't have that kind of sukriti. They don't surrender to Krishna. So uh, actually we have an exercise on this. We wanted, we wanted the students to represent. Uh, now, I spoke a bit about the four pious people. I didn't get into the four impious people. I want you to 
research that for yourselves for a little while. I want you to read Prabhupada's purport there. And then we want to hear from you about, well, first of all, how many people do we have here in the class today? We have uh, 15, 15 of us. 15, okay, so we want four groups. We want, uh, so that will be like four people in a group and three in one group and four in the other groups. Okay, group. Four groups. Should I set up the breakout rooms now or later? Yes, let me first of all explain what I want each group to do, right? Okay. There are four kinds of pious people. So, each person in the group, you will take one of the four kinds of impious people. You have four people in the group and each person should take one of the four impious persons. And we want to hear from you. We want your description about this impious person. And one group with three people in, so one person will have to take two. You have to describe two impious persons. All right? We just want you to look at the impious people and tell us what are they like. Describe them for us. Okay, so you can put everyone in the group. Padmalachan Prabhu? Yes, Guru Maharaj, I'm doing it. Okay. Is everyone in the group, is it? I guess so.
So Maharaj, I'll give everyone another minute. Eh? All right. They are all slowly coming back. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay, everybody back now. Yeah, everybody back? Yes. All right, let's hear from group number three. Group number three, Rukmini Mohan and, and Shalavati and Subhadra and uh, Satish Prabhu. So, who, who, who's going to tell us about the mudha? Uh, Subhadra Mataji, maybe you can talk about it in Krishna Maharaj and Hare Krishna everyone. Um, I'll be speaking on murals, that is, uh, they are uh, foolish, uh, grossly foolish, and like they are working hard day and night, um, and uh, they really don't know what they are doing, whom they are working. Like for example, the donkeys, they are working for their master, they are really hard working, but they really don't know the purpose of life, so they are just eating and working hard for the um, master, yeah. That is what I have to say about the uh, mudhas, Hare Krishna. Do you know any mudhas? Uh, donkeys, Maharaj. Oh, you, you don't know any human mudhas? <laughs> Do you, do you know any people in modern life and in, in your own life? Have you have you met any mudhas? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Can you tell us something about them? What were they doing? What was their situation? Um, they're mostly like eating, and they don't want to work at all. They are like uh, looking at the post of others. So. Yeah. Well, I don't know if that's a mudha. That's, you know, something they don't like to work. You know, that's not really what we heard about the mudha. The mudha is something they, they work. Right? Yes. Yeah, let's hear from somebody who else is talking about mudha, some other group. Someone else can tell us something about mudhas? 
So Guru Maharaj, these are you know people who whose only purpose is to work very very hard and make as much money as possible without realizing the goal in life. So I work in the corporate world, and you know ninety percent of my colleagues, ninety percent of my customers are just like this. You know they come early in the morning, they leave for work, and then they are just working hard, 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 thinking that they will enjoy the. You know the salary with their family, etc. And I've seen a few of them only realizing really late that um, you know their hard work was also the cause of disease. And I lost a few of my colleagues just because they had overworked in their lives without realizing what the real purpose in life was all about. Okay. So some of your, you lost some of your own colleagues uh, because they were mudhas, they were alcoholics, huh? Maharaj, I, I work in, at USP in PG and uh, we also have some colleagues who work extremely hard but there's no sublime or higher purpose of life, you know, spiritual aim. So uh, again, they're eating just, you know, hardly eating even, but working so hard. Uh, it's like an S, as uh, Srila Prabhupada mentions, works hard, but the grass is everywhere, but the, the, the S does not realize that the grass is everywhere. And why it's getting so much load, which none of the load, uh, the clothes belong to it. So similarly, we have people working extremely hard, but at the end of the day, this is resting very little on a very small sp space and they're eating uh, meagerly. Mm. So they don't get any real pleasure in life, you say? Yes, Ma Maharaj. Okay. Anyone else there can tell us about mudhas? Did we hear from? Yes, Maharaj. Yes? Simply work, um, work, work, and work, um, thinking that at some point they'll get some happiness, but actually they don't get any happiness out of it. Rather, proper is giving example of how uh, different people they work so hard they hardly have either any time of eating, so they uh, get various diseases. Uh, because they're working so hard, they hardly take care of their bodies, but uh, they are actually working hard so that they can maintain their bodies nicely and have some sense enjoyment. This is like the camels who eat the thorns and uh, the, the blood they're tasting, they feel is uh, tasty. They're, so the molars are like that, they are working so hard. Have you, have you any experience of people like that? Do you know any people like that? Yes? Yes, Maharaj. Do you know, can you tell us who do you know who were Mudhas? I remember in my, in my university, there was one of the teenagers who was working, like, uh, working very hard, 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 would hardly bathe and uh, eat. And we got uh, a very serious uh, problem because he was hardly taking care of himself simply because he was working very hard so that eventually he answered answer to me and then uh, get, to, uh, get to earn a lot of money. Okay, thank you. All right, so mood has been described. Next one is Nara Dhamma. Who would like to tell us first about the Nara Dhamma? Who are they? Raj, uh, uh, I repeat a little bit on uh, Nara Dhamma. Uh, so Nara Dhamma is one who is lowest of the mankind. Uh, Nara means human being, Adhama means lowest. And uh, so Naradhama is one who has no religious principles or does not abide by any religious principles. And human form of life is meant to revive our God consciousness, but he does not do so. And I have some experience with uh, even my relatives. Uh, 
I'm sorry to say, but uh, I see people are engrossed in reading newspapers, magazines, etc. They're not taking interest in uh, scripture readings, etc. So how can one establish one's lost relationship when one does not uh, try to study the scriptures or follow the path that's uh, given by the scriptures and uh, listen to saintly persons? They have no interest. All right. Yes. And did they did they have any kind of uh, upbringing? Did they have any kind of piety in their upbringing? Well, well, you know, materially, they're well educated, and they have. Uh, can we say like that? Are yeah, materially, they're well educated, uh, Maharaj, and there's some. It's just a little bit mixed here because they they do have some piety. Uh, they worship. Uh, demigods sometimes they may go and attend some functions uh, religious whether it's authentic uh, bona fide uh, spiritual discipline or not but uh, most of the time is spent uh, wasted simply by uh, sense uh, pursuing material uh, most of the time it's wasted materially okay then someone else Let's hear from some other group about Naradhamma. Thank you, Maharaj. I would like to try, Maharaj. Yes, go uh, ahead. Uh, uh, Naradhamma are those who are the lowest mankind. They are all born in very good families. They are all, uh, they, are, they, uh, they are brought, they have very good education. They are born in good family. They have everything. But they don't take advantage of uh, worshipping Krishna, going into Krishna consciousness and sometimes even in Krishna consciousness family we have our children who are born, have good education, are brought up in Krishna consciousness but they don't take advantage of being in that good, uh, easy, comfortable con uh, environment to take up Krishna consciousness. Even the children, huh? Yeah, it's, I can give you an example, like my children, they take it for granted. Oh, my parents do everything, you know. I will only chant when I'm in trouble, exams are closed. They are, in, they are in a very good situation, good education, they have everything. But they just don't want to take the advantage of Krishna consciousness. Like they are, I would call them like that. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Maybe, can I just add one more point, Guru Maharaj? I actually know of um, this cousin of mine, right? So he grew up in a really nice, opulent family. They used to go to the Ipo temple, etc. But he, he was just not interested. He took up to heavy alcohol drinking. So much so that he even en engaged his children in drinking. And... Finally, the result was that he was killed by his own children. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the entire facility was given to him. He was brought up in a great family, vegetarian, Lord Krishna, devotees, etc. Everything was given on the platter, but no, lowest of men. Oh. Yes, thank you. And, and you, another group can add something about Naradamas? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. So in the purport, like adding to the Mataji's point, uh, Prabhupada mentioned the example of the two brothers, Jagai and Madai. Like how they got delivered by Nityananda Prabhu. And uh, Prabhupada also mentioned that even Naradama can be can revive their spiritual consciousness by only by the mercy of uh, devotee. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, very good. So how how can we how do you give that mercy? How are you going to give that mercy? Guru Maharaj, can I just say one thing? Uh, this person who, this person I was explaining, he actually got the mercy. You went and distributed books in his shop, you know, but he still did not take advantage of that. 
I have a photograph of you going and distributing books and collecting funds for the Ipoh temple. But this guy did not take advantage of it. How foolish. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Naradama, generally we say, you know, they're born in the good families, they're, they may be Brahmana also, even like that, maybe high caste, or may even the family may be devotees and like that. So they have every opportunity by birth, but they don't take it. They think, oh, it's not important. It doesn't matter. Of course. May I ask? Yes? I think they may not have the that much security to accept that, that uh, Krishna consciousness. Am I right, Maras? They, well, they, it may be that, you know, they're waiting. You know, sometimes like when people are very young, they, they wait a little bit longer in their life, you know. They want to, uh, you know, they feel that while we're young, it's not so necessary to take religion very actively. But later on, then they may think more seriously about it. And just like Srila Prabhupada, when he was a young man, you know, he was, he was born in a good family, but he was doing his business and he got married. And even he met Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, that was 1922. And then again they met 1933, so it took 11 years. And then 1933 he became active, he became a devotee, he got initiation and everything. But sometimes, you know, there's no loss to plant the seeds and to give people an opportunity to hear about Krishna, to, to find out about Krishna consciousness. Certainly seeds are there, giving people that opportunity, the association. And later on they'll remember. But the Naradama tendency is that, well, you know, doesn't matter, it's not important. And just enjoy life. So, you say that they are born in good families, at the same time they are talking about uh, they are more unfitness. We know that unfitness is not in the I kind of feel it's uh, they are very uneducated certain things. So, I get a little confused. They are the yeah. uncivilized Well, they're materially prosperous, they're enjoying the material comforts, material facilities, and they have the opportunity for spiritual culture. By birth, they may have been born in a good family, high caste and so on, and they may even have association. but. They don't, they, don't, they don't take it up, they're not interested, just they think it's, it's not important. There's other, so many other things to do. You know, what do they do with their life? Oh, people go and play golf all day, you know. <laughs> there's so many people, they, they, they get their golf clubs and they go and play golf and, and they think that's more important than going to temple. <laughs> And so Naradamas, they waste their life and they go to football matches and they play games and so on things and then and just pass their time in these ways. But go to temple, oh. so Naradama, they're thinking like that. All right, and then we have the Maya Aparita Jnana. Who can give us some explanation, uh, description? Maras, yes. Actually, in Mahabharata Gyan, that is when their knowledge has been nullified or stolen by the illusor energy or material energy. Actually, in this category, all the great scholars like um, poets, scientists, philosophers, and literary persons are uh, coming on this category. Actually, this, uh, as per this Brahma Sangita, that uh, Isar Param Krishna Satchidananda Vikra Anadi Adira Govinda. Sarva Karanam Karanam. And Krishna is the Supreme Personality Godhead. And a person's duty is to surrender at the lotus feet. But these people, they, they use their own brain and they don't uh, 
हिमसेल्फ सरेंडर और दे डोंट गिव चांस टू अदर्स टू सरेंडर दे इवन द सम स्कॉलर्स ऑफ द भगवत गीता दे राइट इन देयर मुंडेन दे यूज देयर मुंडेन एक्टिविटीज एंड दे राइट इन देयर ओन वे एंड दे नेवर सरेंडर एट द लोटस फीट ऑफ कृष्णा एंड दे इंटरप्रेट कृष्णा एज द इंपर्सनल ब्रह्म समटाइम्स आल्सो सो under this category i have seen in my life that i really uh, actually i am working in uh, scientific organization i am also scientist but i have seen in our organization 99% nine they have not surrender even they don't believe in uh, krishna even if you yeah, i am uh, practically giving uh, the uh, 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 there to uh, <coughs> bhagavad gita to them they are taking the bhagavad gita but they don't read and they tell in the uh, interpret that This is some of the people the writing just like uh, stories Bhagavad Gita has been written. So they don't accept the Bhagavad Gita or they don't accept the knowledge uh, given in the uh, other spiritual scriptures like Shrimad Bhagavatam, Ramayan. They don't accept. They are telling that these are the story books. They don't accept the things. They want to see the. Uh, I have uh, come across the many people. They want to see. Can you show this now? Don't give such type of logics about the Krishna. <laughs> when you will see krishna then only you will believe so they generally believe in seeing or by the experimental things they don't believe in such type of logics okay yes thank you prabhu yes very nice krishna maharaj uh, the there is very clearly written here that uh, uh, is is my uh, voice audible uh, yes you are clear go ahead uh, it is very clearly written that uh, because they don't surrender uh, the illusion in it will misguide them and uh, therefore they disobey the uh, supreme lord and uh, maya apahrita gyana basically the maya has stolen away their uh, whatever knowledge they have and uh, as as vanidhi uh, uh, prabhu also told in this practically do they don't come uh, they explain the bhagavad gita concepts and all those things uh, philosophy but uh, they are not as per the parampara and they think uh, lord is the ordinary human being and uh, uh, even after so many clear instructions in bhagavad gita they don't uh, accept that yes yeah. and uh, what what uh, from my personal experience i feel that uh, um, sometimes uh, i am in a mura category sometimes i am in a uh, Uh, Naradama category. Sometimes I mean, it takes a mix of something. Uh, my 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 thought moves in different uh, places. Uh, that's what uh, the different situations basically. That's what uh, my experience is. Uh, so that sometimes <laughs> suddenly, suddenly I come to know that okay, Krishna is the supreme. Then I come back again. <laughs> then it it moves. I don't know whether everyone experiences this, but I am experiencing this kind of. Uh, Okay. okay, you yourself feel influenced sometimes by these different kinds of people. Yes. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Yes. Anybody else like to add to the Maya Parita Gyana? Silavati Mati Maras, Silavati Mati Ji, may I want to hear? Yes. Hi, I am Hari Krishna. Um, mine is also a continuation of here. Yeah. Doesn't believe the Buddha's uh, saying that um, that sometimes they think that because Krishna was born from uh, Yasudama, they think that he is a human being. That they don't accept him as a supreme personality of God, and, and they are also educated materially and like uh, Maya has all also stolen their. Their intelligence and misguided them to disobey the supreme personality of God. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Maya has misguided them. <laughs> Maya has bewildered them. They think Krishna to be an ordinary person. All right, and then finally the Asuram Bhavam Ashita. Who would like to tell us first? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, So the Asuric people are the demonic people who don't believe in the existence of God. 
so they will um, try to prove by any method that you know the god is not, the lord is not existing but they don't have any tangible reason why the god is the lord is not existing so they said the lord, they say that lord cannot uh, you know incarnate or come into this material world or they have their own reason why um, you know oh even if he even if he comes they are subjected to the three modes of material nature they can give their own um, explanations with their mental concoction saying uh, why the lord cannot come or even the impersonalists um, sometimes um, believe that you know only this with their limited knowledge they want to prove that uh, the lord care, does not do not exist and that's why you know we should not believe in them or the other category uh, they um, Uh, they say that they are god like the, uh, they sh- they say so many uh, wrong incarnations saying that they are god and you please believe me because i have this power i have that power they don't realize that they don't have the six opulences in full like how lord krishna has so in at one part of my uh, um, my life itself i was following an atheist for some time so it's not that uh, my mother sent me to those classes because they are teaching bhagavad gita but uh, luckily they didn't i didn't read any of the translations they taught so through them i learned some of some around 25 verses of bhagavad gita when i was a small girl but um, somehow because i didn't know the uh, read their translation i was saved that uh, um, so krishna somehow protected me and brought me back into krishna consciousness so um, um, so all these different incarnations kalki bhagwan has come especially south india is famous for bringing all sorts of uh, funny incarnations suddenly they will say nityananda uh, there is this funny personality nityananda so uh, <laughs> videos keep coming up as once in a while we, but we shouldn't be seeing them but uh, they have their own funny explanations how the earth came into existence and how things happened and how the lord is within this and that means they are very uh, they they give their own explanations which are uh, very uh, difficult to accept also actually at many times <laughs> okay yes certainly there's a lot of it going on there's a lot of uh, bogus incarnations and uh different atheistic philosophies being pro- propagated even in the name of re- religion there's atheistic philosophies mayavadi philosophy is also atheistic because they say there's no god actually but whom i was following also actually he says that uh, he he doesn't say that he is not god my followers make me god talk that i am god but i don't say i am a god but he is not saying that he is not god to his followers so somewhere uh, <laughs> he wants to prove that he is superior or something uh-huh okay anybody like to add anything on to the atheistic part are you sure are you sure are you acting it oh. as a role play sorry i'm here in a kashku i'm god everyone should follow me um um Oh you're god yeah there yeah. is no other god apart from me uh-huh. and even today we can see in our world now we can see there are so many people who wants to control other nations so currently we having the russian president who thinks he is god and such atheistic person will never surrender to the lord and will always want to harm others and he is killing so many people so many innocent people um hoping our devotees in ukraine are doing the best and in russia trying to preserve their uh, faith in trying to let them come to surrender of the supreme lord but atheistic persons like hirena kashpu there are so many um persons still who are like um, hirena kashpu we had a we ha- i had a, a devotee here who would say that his father always said i am kans i am to be worshiped no one should worship anyone else i should be <laughs> sir why are you offering to krishna you should give it to me first so <laughs> there are people like that hari krishna thank you thank you yes anyone else final hari krishna maharaj yes go ahead prabhu 
Uh, I think like uh, uh, demons, uh, when the God is present in, the, in front of them also, they cannot be able to understand that God is standing in, the, in front of them. This kind of mentality. Even uh, all gods are present in front of them, they will not recognize he is a God. That kind of mentality. No, okay. They, think, <laughs> they, they won't recognize God even if he was standing in front of them. Huh? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. What? Thank you so much. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, I would like to add uh, one point to Supreme Nagadev Mataji, where she told that uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> yes, when, when, <clears throat> Hare Krishna. when when you, we are doing out this program, Maharaj, there is, we met one person who said that since Rama hit Bali from behind, Rama incurred sin and became as Krishna, like that he told. So, uh, and he and he told like that that the Rama incurred sin eating Bali and like and came as Lord Krishna. So Krishna also uh, comes under the mode of material nature like that he told. So they they concord the story like that. So it is an uh, Maya Apradi like like that. Okay. Yes. The question here. Uh -huh. uh, is it okay to ask questions now? All right. Maharaj, uh, in the uh, Naradama category also, we see that uh, the knowledge is being uh, uh, made null and void by the all-powerful energy of physical nature. So how is it different from Maya or the Jnana? So uh, that's, that's a slight doubt in my uh, reading, I don't know. How is it different from Jnana? The Maya or the Jnana Maya. also is that the knowledge has been stolen and uh, in, in Naradama also it is written that uh, their knowledge, they are educated but uh, they, uh, it just becomes null and void by the alpha. Well, alpha. yeah, there are, of course there are, there, there are border, there are similarities there. It's not hard and fast, so he's a Naradama or oh, he's Maya Paritagyana. Uh, there can be a mixture of these different roles, these different positions within the people within the duskritina. The common term is they're all duskritinas. They have no piety for devotional service. Namam duskritino mudha. Right? So duskritina. They have no piety to take up devotional service. They may be Naradama in one, in one way and they may also be Maya Piritagyana. We say Naradama in the sense they have a good birth. They did have the opportunity for Krishna consciousness. But the Maya Aparita Jnana, they speculate. They don't follow parampara. They have their own philosophy. They think they know better. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, we'll go ahead here. Oh. Draw up a chart showing reasons for turning towards Krishna and the reason why we distance ourselves. Also possibly explore whether our desires have been fulfilled. Have our motives changed over time? <laughs> it would take some time to do that. <laughs> I don't think we have time today to go through all that. Uh, turning Anyway, reasons for turning towards Krishna. Why do people come towards Krishna? We said there are four reasons, right? Chatur Vida Bhajanti Mam Jnana Sukriti no Arjuna. They're all they all have Sukriti. The ones who don't surrender, they're Duskritina. But the, those people who surrender, they have Sukriti. So they've come to Krishna, they have some Sukriti. And their reasons may be, of course, may be material. They came towards Krishna. Some come in distress, some come in search of wealth, some come in out of curiosity, and some come in knowledge. Uh, why people may distance ourselves from Krishna? That the, they didn't have the Sukriti, they didn't have the piety. Whether our desires have been fulfilled, have our, have our motives changed over time? Generally it does happen that in the beginning we may come with desires Sometimes people come, as we said, some people come uh, in, for economic reasons and then they become a devotee and then somebody offers them a job. 
And when they are offered the job, they, they may give up Krishna consciousness. And somebody else is in distress, and after a while then the distress is over, and he may want to go back and enjoy the material world. There was one young man, he had an argument with his girlfriend, and he was very um, heartbroken, and he came to the temple, we taught him to chant and everything, and then he, was, he became happy. But then after some, he said, no, I want to go now. I want to find another girlfriend, <laughs> you know. So, uh, he had, he had the, some desire, he had some distress, but he thought the distress was over. But if people actually get knowledge, the point is if they actually get knowledge, then they'll be fixed in Krishna consciousness. So our motives do change over time. And gradually we, we may come with material desires in the beginning, but these motives change in course of time. And because Krishna purifies the heart, he takes away the material desires. Can you think of some devotees who came to Krishna consciousness with material desires and then they lost it in course of time? Yes? There are... Um... I have met some persons who are wanting to marry some, uh, some Russian devotees or something like that with their mind and then uh, they came to Krishna consciousness and then suddenly uh, when, when they knew the philosophy they changed that kind of uh -huh. <laughs> Okay, yeah. But from the scriptures, can you think of some examples? People who have... <laughs> Gajendra. Gajendra, right. Gajendra, Dhruva Maharaj, right. Okay, we'll go ahead. We're going on to the next section to hear about demigod worship. In the seventh chapter, Lord Krishna was desc he described four kinds of people who surrender and four who don't. And the, of the four who surrender, who is the best one? Knowledge. Knowledge. Right. The one in full knowledge. But do they make progress very quickly? No. Birth after birth. Right. Take some time, long time, many births, right? And what's the goal of knowledge? One time The goal of knowledge is to surrender to Krishna, right? That's the goal of knowledge. All right, now, not everybody will surrender to Krishna, but some people may surrender to demigods. They may take up worship of other gods. So that's also discussed in seventh chapter. We're going to look at that now and hear about worshipping. We know it's very common among Indian people. And here you see Lord Ganesh. People often like to worship Lord Ganesh. It's very attractive. Certainly, <laughs> I find it very uh, attractive myself. So sometimes people would ask Prabhupada about this also. Can we worship Ganesh? <laughs> you know, sometimes Prabhupada would, would, he would need money. Like Prabhupada was building the temple in Juhu and he, we needed money. And where to get the money? We didn't have a big congregation in Srila Prabhupada's time. We didn't have a big congregation and there wasn't a lot of donors coming forward. So how could Prabhupada get money? So one of the devotees suggested we could do Ganesh worship. So we'll hear how Prabhupada responded to that, first of all. So Prabhupada said, concerning Ganesh worship, it is not actually necessary for us. Sometimes people think we, we have to do that. And people often put Ganesh over the doorway or something. They think Ganesh will destroy the obstacle. But we don't, the Vaishnavas, we don't do that. But then Prabhupada said, but if someone has a sentiment for getting the blessings of Ganesh in order to get large amounts of money, for Krishna's service, 
then it is all right. But anyone who takes up this kind of worship must send me, <laughs> now not this point, Prabhupada, he's approving it to get large amounts of money, he said, it's all right, so you're going to do this, you must send me at least $100,000 a month, not less. If he cannot send this amount, then he cannot do Ganesh worship. <laughs> and that was 1975. No, $100,000 then, that's like a million dollars now. <laughs> so, you, you, you would be, it would be better to have a, get a Shaimantaka jewel. You need a Shaimantaka jewel, you can create gold every day. So, Maharaj, in one way, Srila Prabhupada uh, sort of said, no, we don't, we don't worship uh, Ganesha, you know, something like that. I mean, based on this. Uh, well, you can see he's saying, you know, you want to worship Ganesha. <laughs> he, he, of course, he doesn't approve it. And he didn't, he didn't allow it in any of our temples also. Although different people from time to time would say to Prabhupada that we should have Ganesh. When we opened the Hyderabad temple in Abbots, uh, at that time the devotee was there and he said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, you know, he said, everybody in this city, they all worship Lord Shiva. So he said, why don't we put a Shiva Linga here? And then he said, everybody will come to our temple and then they can all worship Madan Mohan because in Hyderabad we have we have Madan Mohan, we have also Gorni Thai and we have Jagannath Baladev Subhadra. So uh, the devotee was saying if we put a Shiva Linga people will come and worship Lord Shiva and then they'll come and see the other deities. But Prabhupada said no. He said, we don't want to do that. And Prabhupada explained the reason. He said, we don't want to do that. He said, because they will think it's all one. They will think all are one, all are the same. They will think Shiva, Durga, Ganesh, Krishna, they're all one. They're all the God. So Prabhupada was very cautious about this. He didn't introduce demigod worship in any of our temples. He didn't sanction it. And the reason was he was worried that people would misunderstand. They would just, just like you go to other temples, you go to other Hindu temples, and you'll see they have all of the gods, all of the gods, everybody's there. So Prabhupada didn't want our temples like that. He wanted people to know who is actually the Supreme. All right? Yes? So there are uh, two things which I would to say. One is I wanted to ask, means there is this uh, belief or thought that you should start all the work by first praying to Ganesha and then you start all auspicious work. Yeah. Yes, well, it's even mentioned if you read the Nectar of Devotion. In the Nectar of Devotion, there are regulated principles in the practice of Bhakti Yoga and it's mentioned there also that we should worship Lord Ganesh. And you, if you, the, the Gos, from the Goswamis, uh, Sanatana Goswami, he was a great devotee of Lord Shiva. Although he was, he was living in Vrindavan, he, but he was, he was a great devotee of Lord Shiva also. So, the, how to understand these things, we have to understand Prabhupada was teaching us how to present Krishna consciousness to the, to the world, to the whole world. So he said it's not necessary to worship Ganesh. We didn't... 
even in south indian temples many temples wherever i visited if it's a vishnu temple the main deity will be vishnu so the big dome will be a vishnu and the there are all the other small small uh, uh, temples for the demigods like uh, and uh, you know lord ganesha and other demigods kartikeya and everyone but if you go to a shiva temple main dome will have lord shiva linga in it and the other small uh, uh, demi uh, you know like vishnu will be like a demigod place sitting in different uh, oh yes uh, yeah are all, actually it's very confusing so so the shiva worshipers will think shiva is great and the you know everyone else is demigod oh, i know yeah and it's the opposite to the others many many years ago i was distributing books in south india and we were taking sets of uh, shrimad bhagavatam and chaitanya charitamrita distributing them in libraries and colleges and we approached also some temples uh, a number of temples also took our books i remember showing the pictures the illustrations to some people some of the priests in uh, the in some of the shiva temple and the, the one man said he said oh you know there's a picture lord shiva is sitting below a banyan tree and above him above lord shiva is a form of lord krishna or lord vishnu he's meditating lord shiva's meditating on lord vishnu and he, they said to me he said this picture is wrong it should be vishnu on the bottom and shiva on the top <laughs> They, they said Vishnu meditates on Shiva. <laughs> they didn't accept that Shiva's meditating on Vishnu. So Prabhupada was very cautious. He wanted to introduce people to Krishna, to Krishna particularly, and the uh, Jagannath also, it's Lord Krishna, Gornitai also krishna so demigod worship is something very sensitive sometime back there were articles appearing in back to godhead magazine about demigod worship and the the hindu sangam in malaysia protested they said you should not call the worship of lord shiva as a demigod and they should the word is deva they are all devas <laughs> they say this word demi god is an insult to these lords they say they should all be called devas they are all devas <laughs> so it's very sensitive issue we have to be very careful cautious in dealing demi god but prabhupa did appreciate demi god worship because he said it's on the vedic path he said compared to something like christianity you know somebody's a christian is it better to be a christian or is it better to worship demigods probably the person who's worshiping demigods is actually better situated because he's in the vedic path and following the, the vedic path one day he will come to worship the supreme lord so one may worship demigods in the beginning and then go on to understand there's a supreme lord because when you worship demigods the results of demigod worship is going to be material limited and temporary so an intelligent person will consider why should i worship a demigod if i'm going to get something which is temporary and material better i get something which is eternal and so they will inquire how can i get something which is eternal and at that time then we can introduce them to the worship of the supreme lord all right someone can read this mulojan bro question bro I impersonally imagine the various demigods to be forms of the Lord. For example, the Mayavadis worship five demigods, Pancho Pasana. They do not actually believe in the form of the Lord, but for the sake of worship, they imagine some form to be God. Generally, 
they imagine a form of Vishnu, a form of Shiva, and forms of Ganesh, the sun god and Durga. This is called Pancho Pasana. Srimad Bhagavatam 6.4.34 per point. Hare Krishna. Mm. So these are the prominent demigods. And as described here, they think all of these forms are just imaginary. They imagine some form to be God. They don't think there can actually be any actual form. They do not actually believe in the form of the Lord. They think ultimately everything is impersonal. So their worship of demigods is like that. And on the other hand, we have people who are impersonalists. So, a little exercise for you. Just take out your Bhagavad Gita and look at text number 24. And we want you to pick out the different notions of the impersonalists from that purport of text 24. Right? Chapter 7, text 24. Just take a few minutes to go through the purport and see if you can pick out some of the different notions of the impersonalists.
Actually, Ranga Devi Mataji and her sister have raised their hands. Maybe they can go first. Yes. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. So, here the impersonalists uh, think that the uh, Lord has no form. And if at all he has a form, then that is imposed upon him. His body, his activities, everything, they're all Maya. Alright, so there, first of all, the first notion of the impersonalist is that God has no form. And if he does have a form, it's a form of Maya. Right? Yes. Is that your two points? Yes. Okay. Someone else? Krishna Raj, throughout we are now talking about demigod and god worship. So, at so many places uh, it's written that uh, those who are worshipping demigods go to demigod planet and those who worship Krishna go to Krishna Loka. So, we are understanding that they are all having their planets, of their, they all have planets of their own. So, um, without the, they're all personality having a planet of their own. So, uh, just a white thing cannot have a planet of its own. So, it's very clearly understandable that uh, this impersonalism doesn't fit Bhagavad Gita saying that uh, it's, they're oh. all personal. All right, so the, the demigods actually are, are persons, they're actually individual identities and they have their planets. They're not just some fictitious being, they're actually persons, individuals, right? Yeah. Okay, someone else? Hare Krishna Maharaj, it also states that impersonalists are saying Krishna is an ordinary person because uh, he came from Devaki in Vasudeva, so he has an ordinary body like everyone else, like any other living entity. Yes, okay. So they think Krishna to be an ordinary person, a human being who takes birth, or a great person in history or something. Subhadra Mataji. Uh, those who are blinded by lusty desires surrender onto different demigods? Yes. People who... But we're talking, we want to hear about impersonalism. The notions of the impersonalists. Guru Smarana Mataji. Hare Krishna Raj. Because the impersonalists, they do not understand God's personal nature. So therefore, they are unable to come to the ultimate uh, knowledge of the absolute truth. So they are basically, I uh, have uh, realized only up to Brahman or maybe Paramatma, but not up to the Bhagwan feature. Okay. The impersonalists, they can simply understand the Lord as Brahman. They say ultimately everything is Brahman. Shankaracharya, he gave prominence to the statement, Sarvam Kauvidam Brahma, that everything is Brahman. And so the demigods and the Supreme Absolute Truth and Lord Krishna and all the living entities were all Brahman. So they, they, they can only think in terms of the oneness of everything. And they, for them, there's no, there's no energy. There's simply Brahman. Everything is Brahman. It's not like we say, we talk about the Supreme Lord. He's energetic and he has his energy. But for the impersonalists, there's no question of energy. There's no energetic, there's no energy, there's only simply Brahman, just simply the oneness. Yeah, um, uh, they, they, impersonalists, they don't even follow uh, what Shankaracharya has said, uh, that uh, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. And uh, that, that there is no trace of uh, devotional service because of which uh, they, they get lost completely. Yeah, definitely. The, the impersonalists say they don't take up devotional service. Rather, what, what do they take up? What's their path? 
How do they understand the Supreme? How do they come to realize the Supreme? They don't realize the Supreme actually, they just want to merge into the Supreme. And how, but how do they go about doing that? Meditation? By meditating on uh, different forms of the Lord. Yes. Just, uh, by meditation and by their own speculation. Speculation. Mm -hmm. By their own speculation. They will study Vedanta Sutra and speculate. Try to understand the Vedanta by their own minds, by their mental, intellectual exercise. So Lord Krishna himself described the, 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 most, the thinking of the impersonalists in this verse, text number 24. Uh, as Lord Krishna says, they think that the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna was impersonal before and has now assumed this personality. And so that is the, the, the wrong notion of the impersonalists. They're thinking Krishna was originally impersonal. In other words, Lord Krishna came from the Brahman. But Rather, the Brahman comes from Krishna, just the opposite. Okay, we'll go ahead. Yes, someone can read. You go ahead. Oh, oh, okay, that's useless. You, we can't understand anything you're saying. There's something wrong with your mic. Okay, I'll read in person. Yes. Go ahead. And it's cool. you can start. Small mudas are working hard only to become happy, and the big muda wants to become God. The small muda wants to become a minister or a president, and the big muda wants to become God. The disease is the same. I shall become the most powerful, but that is not possible. Only Krishna is the most powerful. Lecture on Bhagavad Gita, 4.20, Bombay, 1974. So this, this is a very nice quote. This is a very nice quote. You want to remember this one. Small mudas working very hard only to become happy. And the big muda, he's working hard also. He wants to become God. <laughs> The small muda is working hard to become minister or become a president, and the big muda, he wants to become God. The same disease. So this is not possible. Only Krishna is the most powerful. Okay, and here's a very nice verse. Krishna says, Someone read? Yes, some, who would like to read? 725? Aham prakasha sarvasya yoga maya samavrita mudaham na abhijanti lokomam ajam avayam I am never manifest to foolish and unintelligent. For them, I am covered by my internal potency, and therefore they do not know that I am unborn and infallible. Infallible, right. Infallible. Krishna is unborn and infallible. Ajam avyayam. He doesn't take birth. He's, he's aja. He doesn't take birth. And he's avyayam, infallible. And this is the... He's covered by his... Yoga Maya Samavrita. The Yoga Maya, Krishna is covered by that Yoga Maya. And so, Krishna, the, these foolish and unintelligent people, they cannot understand Krishna. Mudho, the Mudhas, the Mudha people, they cannot understand. They're foolish people. Krishna covers himself by his internal potency. So even if Krishna was to appear in the world today, people would not surrender. They wouldn't know. Just like 5,000 years ago, Lord Krishna appeared, but not everyone surrendered to him. Not everyone knew that Krishna is God. 
Only a few people like the Pandavas, even you see Duryodhan, they didn't surrender. The Kauravas, they didn't surrender. Even Krishna showed his universal form, but they still didn't surrender to Krishna. So Krishna doesn't reveal himself to these foolish and unintelligent people. And he covers himself by this yoga maya, his own potency. And when he covers himself, then they, they, what happens? Then they think, oh, he's an ordinary person. He's just like us. And people think, well, Krishna take birth. And they think Krishna took birth and they thought Krishna died also. People think like that. They, they don't understand these things. Krishna tricks them. So, very important verse here. We often use this in preaching. Okay? And another nice verse. Did someone read? Nabaraj Prabhu, are you there? Okay, shall we move on to Priti Priyanka? Iksha Devisha Samuti Na Dvandva Mohena Bharata Sarva Bhutani Samoham Sarge Yanti Parantapa Bhagavad Gita 7.27 O Skan of Bharata, O Conqueror of the Four, all living entities are born into delusion, bewildered by dualities arising from desire and hate. Desire, Icha and hate, Dvesha. Icha and Dvesha, where these are the dualities. And because of this desire and hate, uh, uh, the, we're put into so much delusion. Dvanva Mohina, Bara, Mohina, the delusion. We become bewildered. Sarva Bhutani Samoham, all living entities. Sargi Yanti Parantapa, O conqueror of the foe. So all living entities are born into delusion, bewildered by these things, by dualities. The dualities which come from, the, what are these dualities? We're thinking, I like, I don't like, this is good, this is bad, I want, I don't want. And so desire and hate. Desire to be God and hatred of God. We want to be God ourselves, or we hate God. No, everything comes from these things. Icha, dvesha, desire and hate. Because of these things, then we're in so much delusion. And then takes 28, another very powerful verse. Please read. Ras Bihari Prabhu? Yes, yes. Yesham Tvantagata Papam Janam Punya Karmanam Te Dvangva Persons who have acted pious, piously in previous lives and in this life and whose simple actions are completely eradicated are free from the dualities of delusion and they engage themselves in my service with determination. Okay. Dridavrat. Dridhavrat, determination, bhajanti mam dridhavrata. So that determination, that's very important. We will hear this word that in, the, in the ninth chapter also, it will come again, describing the Mahatmas. Here, Lord Krishna is describing people who are actually taking up serious devotional service. The qualification to take up serious devotional service. Right? Of course, if you're going to worship Krishna with determination, you have to become very serious. So, 
What's the qualification? First of all, mentioned, yesham twanta gatam papam. We have to be free from sinful activities. From the in our past, you know, we're all here in the material world, and we're all guilty of sinful acts. And that's why we've taken birth in the material world. That's why we're here. If we were not sinful, we wouldn't be here. We would be in the spiritual world. But because we're sinful, we've taken our birth here in this place. Now we have to get free from these reactions, the sinful reactions. So to get free from the sinful reactions uh, takes some time. It takes also uh, good activities. And so it's mentioned punya karmana. People, they, not only do they have to be free from the sinful actions, but we have to also have acted piously in previous lives and in this life. So punya karmana, it means pious work. So what is that pious work? That has to be understood. We'll talk about that in a minute. But there's one more point, and it mentions we should be also free from the dualities of delusion. Danva moha te danva moha nirmukta. So we, if someone is really determined to come to the high standard of devotional service, these things are required. Free from sinful reactions. You must have acted piously in previous lives and in this life. And we have to be free from the dualities of delusion. Then we can take up staunch devotional service. Or we may say, oh, I'll never do it then. <laughs> no, but you're already here in Krishna consciousness. You've already come to Krishna consciousness. So... You're on the way. We're already well on the way. Okay. This, this is just a quick exercise. What things are stopping us from seeing Krishna and how to overcome them? Yeah, anybody like to tell me something that's stopping you from seeing Krishna? Being too uh, uh, Bruce Marana Mataji. You can go ahead, Prabhu, after you. Okay, being very attached to family, being very attached to my material duties, etc. Mm, material attachments, yes. Material duties, respond designations in the material world. How to overcome them? Um, by, you know, um, following the regulations, doing, engaging uh, sincerely in my sadhana, reading uh, the right association. Yes, good. You know everything. <laughs> so, you, sh you just have to apply. Anybody else? In Guru Sikhism, all teachers in the teachers of Krishna. Uh, Sorry? Engaging uh, material desires in the further desire of the Krishna. Oh, so yes. Engaging everything in the service of Lord Krishna. Okay. Engage your material desires dovetail in the service of Krishna. Okay. Yes? Many, many times uh, I get uh, deluded uh, with some talents which I have. Okay, I'm good at this, I'm good at that. So it stops me from seeing this. <laughs> okay, I'm very good. Okay, someone says, oh, Mataji, you're so good at this. So then later on, I realized that whatever little talent I have got is also given by Krishna. So we should use it in the Lord's service. Uh, that's the way to overcome it. So whatever is being given by the Lord, use it in the Lord's service. Mm, okay, yes. Very nice. Whatever we have, use it in the Lord's service. 
two others have uh, raised their hands. Guru Smarana Mataji, followed by Silamati Mataji and Rukmani Mohan Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, as um, in the verse itself, uh, if we are not uh, doing devotional service with determination, then seriously doing it, then it's difficult to see. It may stop us from seeing everything, oh, whatever really? is happening around us as Krishnas. Okay. So the only way to do it, as you mentioned, the three qualifications, we have to stop sinning, we have to act piously, and we also have to be free from the dualities of delusion. So the Shri Prabhupada has given the greatest way of doing it by following in the footsteps of uh, de devotees. Like Shri Prabhupada has given the recommended sadhana, if we follow that seriously, then definitely we can do devotional service very seriously and we can see Krishna. Jai! One day we will see Krishna. Yes. One day very soon. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Krishna Maharaj, uh, I feel that uh, we should follow the orders of our Guru, Guru Maharaj. Uh, when we follow the orders of Guru Maharaj, it will please Krishna and eventually we can see him, I think. All right. Yes. If you please Krishna's devotees, the pure devotees of Krishna, then certainly Krishna will be pleased. Yes. Okay. Rukmani Mohan. Yeah, Maharaj, I was thinking that we could do things ritualistically, but uh, on the other hand, we can also try to develop higher taste, param drishtva nivartate. So when we uh, develop higher taste, then our tendency to be attached to basic qualities will be uh, uh, gradually vanquished. Yes. So, I think as opposed to just being following our devotional activities ritualistically, we should uh, try to uh, develop uh, ruchi taste. Thank you. Yes, okay. We want to develop the higher taste rather than just a taste of dry rituals. We definitely want to get a higher taste. That means a taste particularly for direct service to Krishna. Maybe serving the deities and doing more kirtan in this way, really directly glorifying Krishna, taking up kirtan and uh, offering the arti and so on. These things will help us to develop that higher taste. And we'll, with the higher taste, then the, the lower taste will be forgotten about. Okay, we'll go ahead. Here's a quote from Prabhupada, who lectured on this verse. And Prabhupada said, God consciousness is not a cheap thing. Yesham tvantagatam papam jananam punya karmanam. One who is completely free from all contamination of material modes. Antagatam papam, sinful activities. Te danva moha nirmukta bhajanti mam can stick to the principle of devotional service. Otherwise, if he's not free from the contamination of sinful life, he may make a show of devotion, but that is not actual devotion. Bhaktiya bhas, that is called bhaktiya bhas meaning a shadow of devotion. Someone is making a show of devotion, but at the same time he's engaging in sinful activities, then it is a shadow of devotion, bhaktiya bhas. So we don't want that, we want the real thing, we want pure devotion. So we have to stick to the principles. And then punya karma, we have to understand this, this word. Yesham twantagatam papam jananam punya karmana. So punya karma is described here. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains this point. Is this bhagya, 
bhagya meaning fortune is this fortune the result of an accident or something else in the scriptures devotional service and pious activity are considered fortunate pious activities can be divided into three categories pious activities that awaken one's dormant krishna consciousness are called bhakti mukhi sukriti pious activities that bestow material opulence are called bhogan mukhi sukriti and pious activities that enable the living entity to merge into the existence of the supreme are called moksha unmukhi sukriti these last two awards of pious activities are not actually fortunate so three kinds of pious activity first of all one which uh, awaken our krishna consciousness give bhakti bhakti unmukhi sukriti awakens that's what we want the other ones the bhogan mukhi sukriti you enjoy the bhoga bestow material opulence if you're doing devotional service only to get material opulence that's not pure devotion it's not very good and we hope the people who are in search of material opulence gradually they can become purified and take up real devotional service so bogan mukhi sukriti is not what we want and we also don't want liberation moksha mukhi sukriti if you say if you do service for the impersonalists you may get their moksha you hear their chanting you listen to the chanting from the mayavadis you may get their moksha and their moksha means sayuja mukti oneness giving up your individuality so that's not what we want we don't want that kind of liberation pious activities are fortunate when they help one become krishna conscious the good fortune of bhakti on mukhi is attainable only when one comes in contact with a devotee by associating with a devotee willingly or unwillingly one advances in devotional service thus one's dormant krishna consciousness is awakened this is all taken from the chaitanya charitamrita madhya lila chapter 22 text 46 so this is very important we want to do bhakti unmukhi sukri devotional service must be this kind of pious activity it can only come when we're in contact with devotees so the devotees as prabhupad did we become devotees because of our piety prabhupad said i am creating your piety Prabhupada said I am creating your piety because we by serving Prabhupada by doing service for him we get this bhakti we become qualified to take up devotional service or our dormant krishna consciousness is awakened because we contacted the devotee so that's the real punya karma with something which takes away the Uh, takes away all the maya just simply gives us the good fortune this word fortune the, we will see this also there's another verse in chaitanya charitamrita which describes uh, says brahmanda brahmite konya bhagyavan jeev guru krishna prasadi pai bhakti lata beej when Uh, uh, in chaitanya charitamrita the verse is describing how the living entity is traveling 
through many different species of life and different planets and different universes even, different conditions. But when he becomes actually fortunate, when he's actually fortunate, then he gets the seed of devotion. Brahmanda Brahmite Konya Bhagivanji Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhukti Lata Beach. The seed of devotion, the Bhakti Lata, is put into the heart of the person. The pure devotee puts the seed of Bhakti in their heart. So that is real good fortune. Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhukti Lata Beach. So this is the real meaning of punya karma. You do some service for a devotee or even maybe the devotee gives you prasadam and you eat the prasadam and you like it, you say it's very nice, and you like it. Or you, you get a book and you give a donation for the book. Different ways you do some punya karma, some pious activities, but it must be in relation with a devotee. If you, and if you do these things with a mayavadi, then you'll get, you'll get their impersonal liberation. And if you do it with the karmi, the non-devotee, then you'll just simply get material benefit. You won't get any spiritual benefit. Okay, so we want to look at the main points of chapter 7. Pretty much we've gone through the whole chapter. So the chapter began with knowing Krishna by hearing about him. And we also heard about Krishna's energies. So we've included that all together. First section, knowing Krishna by hearing about him. And then second section, knowing Krishna is the source of both the material and spiritual energies. Everything comes from Krishna, so the, the material energy as well as the spiritual energy. It's all Krishna's. That's described text 8 to 12. And then we heard about the three modes of nature controlled by Krishna, therefore surrender. Right? So that's what we covered yesterday. And then today we've been speaking about the four kinds of impious persons who do not surrender. Right? Who can tell me four kinds of impious persons who do not surrender? The Mudhas, the Maya Pritiganas, Nardama and Asurik. Okay, and what's the one word which describes all of these four people? Duskritina. Duskritina, meaning? Miscreants. What is Miscreants. Miscreants, all right. And what about the four kinds of pious people who do surrender? Miscreants, desire of wealth, education knowledge. Mm. Right. All right, and these four people, pious people, they're all encouraged to come to the platform of Well, they've come to Krishna Consciousness, but we want them to come to the platform of knowledge. Because without knowledge, they'll go away. The, the distress, we'll think the distress is over, I'm going to go now. Or somebody got their economic problem got solved, they thought, oh, I don't need to be a devotee now, I've got money now, I've got a job, I've, I don't need Krishna anymore. We had one boy, he was coming, he was very, very good in asking questions. He had many, many questions, it was very nice. 
His questions were very good. We thought, oh, he's going to be a very good devotee. But then after some time, he didn't come anymore. And so we asked, when we, when we actually met up with him, we asked him, what happened to you? You know, you used to come so often, now you don't come anymore. What happened? He said, oh, I don't have any more questions. <laughs> no more questions. Uh, so he didn't come anymore. So he never really came to the, he never actually came to the platform of realized knowledge. It was just an intellectual exercise, you know, asking questions out of curiosity. But he never actually took up the process. He never really surrendered himself. So it's important to bring people up to the platform of real knowledge and engage them in Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, they would just go back again to the material world. So four kinds of people, are they pure devotees? No. Oh, no. What's their position? Sukriti pious. They're pious, pious. pious people, right? They're all pious. They've all come to Krishna because of their piety. So some people, some of them have material desires, karma misra bhakta, like the one in distress or the one in search of wealth, they're karma misra bhakta. And then you have the one in search of knowledge, jnana misra bhakta. Devotion is mixed with knowledge, desire for knowledge. So then we went on to speak, to speak about demigod worshippers and impersonalists. They don't surrender to Krishna, they surrender to demigods, right? So the demigods worshippers. What's the result of demigod worship? Temporary material benefit. Yeah. Right. Aupa medasham. Meaning, Aupa means very small, meager. So people who worship demigods are in that category. Why do people worship demigods? Immediate. Yeah, to fulfill their material desires. Yes, right. And the impersonalists, why do people take up impersonalism? What's their goal? They want to mix in Brahmacharis. They want to, be, to get oneness with the God. Okay, yeah, they want to, they want to, to get out from the material existence, right? They're trying to liberate themselves from the material world. And they think the way to get out from the material world is to merge into the oneness of the spirit, spiritual existence, into the Brahma Jyoti. So the impersonalists, they want to actually merge into the oneness. And what, what's wrong with that? That's not the real knowledge. What's That's going to happen to the impersonal? They all just speculate. They fall down again. They will 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 again. They they never surrender to Krishna. They don't surrender. Is it also, Maharaj, because they are pious activities, like, is finished over there? Yeah, well, the, the, you don't get liberation just by pious activities. The, the impersonalists don't get into the spiritual world just by piety. They have to really be detached from the material world. They have to give up all kinds of sense gratification. So impersonalists are also transcendentalists. They can enter into the spiritual existence. But the problem is they cannot stay there for long. 
Why? Because their nature, the nature of the soul is to be active. And they won't find that opportunity there in their situation, because their, their goal, Sayuja Mukti, entering into the oneness, giving up their individuality. So it means no, no relationships, no more uh, interaction with any other living entities, just simply only the oneness. There's just only this oneness of Brahman. Everything is Brahman. And this is not going to keep a person satisfied for long. Because the nature of the soul is to enjoy activities. And then we enjoy relationships. And we won't have that opportunity with impersonal liberation. We give up that opportunity if you, if you merge into the oneness. No activities, no relationships, no qualities, everything just simply with the oneness. So, you can't... Would it be fair to say that there's no actual bliss uh, there in the Brahma Jyoti? Well, they can stay in the Brahma Jyoti for some time, but they'll come back. They're going to come back because there's no activity and the nature of the soul, the soul wants activity and wants relationships. There's no spiritual activity. This is a problem with the impersonal philosophy. That their goal is liberation and that's stopping all activities. There's... I have one question to ask sir. Yeah. Actually, mukti of that liberation is also by the mercy of Krishna. But how the impersonalist they get uh, liberation? Uh, whether Krishna gives mercy to them, shows mercy to them. No, I'm sorry, Prabhu, your voice is not so, so clear to me. Maharaj, actually, liberation or that mukti is uh, by the mercy of Krishna. But impersonalist, uh, they get liberation, whether it is by the mercy of Krishna, Krishna shows the mercy to them. Yes, it's also Krishna's mercy, everything is Krishna's mercy, you can say that. The karma is also getting Krishna's mercy when they go to Yama Loka and they go to hell, it's also Krishna's mercy. So the liberation of the impersonalist, Krishna is allowing them to fulfill their desires, they desired that. They desire to enter into the oneness, so Krishna arranges it. They can go there, to that place. They can enter okay. into the one. But the point is they'll come back because the soul's nature yearns for activities and yearns for relationships. And they, they'll come back, they come back and the impersonalists, they'll take up some welfare activities, they'll do some, open a school or open a hospital or something, you know, they'll do some welfare because they don't know what is actually spiritual activity. They don't actually understand what is genuine spiritual activity, which we do in devotional service are hearing, chanting, remembering, but for the impersonalist, their process is negation, to stop everything. So they, they stop everything. They think, they think that devotional service is only the means to the... They don't think that after liberation you should continue devotional service. The impersonalists, they may chant, but they're chanting to become God. And they're worshipping Krishna to become Krishna. That's the mood of the impersonalists. They want to enter into that oneness. So they come back to the material world. And then we heard bewilderment of the living entity, freedom through knowledge of Krishna, different verses describing like that bewilderment of the living, how the living entity is bewildered, Krishna is covered by the material energy, uh, 
covered by his Daivi Maya, Naham Prakisha Sarvat, Yoga Maya, but Krishna's Yoga Maya is covering him. So the living entity cannot understand Krishna. They think of Krishna as an ordinary person. All right. So Prabhupada describes many subjects have been discussed in this chapter. The man in distress, the inquisitive man, the man in want of material necessities, knowledge of Brahman, knowledge of Paramatma, liberation from birth, death and diseases, worship of the Supreme Lord. However, he who is actually elevated in Krishna consciousness doesn't care for the different processes. He simply directly engages himself in activities of Krishna consciousness and thereby factually attains his constitutional position as an eternal servitor of Lord Krishna. In such a situation he takes pleasure in hearing and glorifying the Supreme Lord in pure devotional service. He is convinced that by his doing so all his objectives will be fulfilled. This determined faith is called Dhrita Vrat and it is the beginning of Bhakti Yoga or Transcendental Loving Service. That is the verdict of all scripture. This seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita is the substance of that conviction. From Bhagavad Gita 7.30 purport. Maharaj, I have one question to ask. Yes. Actually, in the uh, previous slide, you showed that the uh, actually elevated Krishna process does not care for the different processes. Actually, here different processes means what? What are the different processes? Hatha Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga. Okay. All these things. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Ross Bihari, Prabhu has a question. Yes. Prabhu, uh, Maharaj, I just wanted to know uh, these impersonalists, after they reach Brahma Jyoti, because they don't have uh, any um, variety or whatever, they come back. Does that mean that they, nev they can never go above that to the Supreme Lord? Means isn't it a stepping, uh, it's also one of the steps towards the Lord, right? Well, they may be fortunate. They may be fortunate, just like sometimes it's described that the Sankirtan party is going back to the spiritual world. They're going to Goloka. And on the way to the spiritual world, they come through the Brahma Jyoti. So at that point, some living entities who are there in the Brahma Jyoti, they may be attracted to the Sankirtan party. And they may join the Sankirtan party. And that way they, they can be liberated. Like Chattu, uh, Chattu Sanakya means contact with the Maha. Ma with Krishna, Lord Vishnu. They are impersonalist first. They in come contact with the... Yes, right. Lives. Yeah, the four Kumaras. They were impersonalists. They became devotees. Yes. Sukadeva, Gos Sukadeva Goswami was on the platform of Brahman. He became attracted. Yes. Became yes. a devotee. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, Guru Smarana Mataji, you are, uh, your line is unmuted. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the lovely classes. I just have a question. Um, yesterday we were talk discussing about the 24 material elements, the energies of the Supreme Lord. And we mentioned that the, the 24th one is Mahat Tattva. Um, can you please explain, is it same as Pradhan or Pradhan is different from Mahat Tattva? Pradhan is the unmanifest stage of the Mahatattva. Pradhan is the unmanifested stage. The Mahatattva is where it actually becomes manifested. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, at the beginning, it's all, everything is unmanifested. So there's Pradhan, and then that Pradhan becomes the Mahatattva. All the elements. Not Mahat Tattva Maharaj, Mahat Tattva, the 24th element. Oh, Mahat Tattva. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Hare so Krishna. is it same as Pradhan? Yes. Mahat it, Tattva? It's d just different. One is manifest, one is not manifest. Oh. Pradhan so is unmanifest. The 24th page, the Pradhan or the Mahat Tattva? Hmm? What? So what is the 24th element? Is it Pradhan or Mahat Tattva? Well, we quoted yesterday from Surrender Unto Me by Burijan Prabhu and he's put Mahatattva. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes? All right. No yeah. other... Guru Maharaj, there are no other questions. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Yes, the Mahatattva is manifest or unmanifest, Maharaj? That's manifest. Okay. So there are no other questions. Um, His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinash Narasimha Maharaj Ki. Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Gaur Premanande. Haribo.